at MongoDB where he coined the term mean stack. So if you remember mean, used to mean Mongo Express Angular Node. Um, and Valeri wrote about it on his blog. I, th I think you were the, the person that invented the term, yeah. right? And then um, he's also the creator of Mongoose, which is, you know, if you're familiar with SQLize, Mongoose is the Mongo equivalent, which is one of the most heavily used um, node ORMs for MongoDB. And number 36 most starred GitHub project. Number 36 most GitHub project. That is really cool. Um, and, and he's also, you know, whenever Valeria has anything to say about the future of how we develop JavaScript, I, I always, you know, pick my ears up and listen. And he started talking to me about this idea that they're working on at Booster Fuels, his current company, and you can tell, talk more about Booster, about how to really kind of integrate, you know, a lot of the stuff we're seeing now in JavaScript development, right? We're doing a lot of front-end stuff, back-end stuff, tying those together, and uh, just really interesting ideas on how they can be more integrated and create a better developer experience. So without further ado, Valeri, thank you. exist in 2014 there was a kind of a lot of um, there's a lot of flux in the on uh, the promise environment <laughs> which is why I don't has anybody here ever used like WenJS or uh, or RSVP or any of these other old promise libraries good because they were uh, they were not a very good idea at the time Bluebird thankfully took over one out and now we have promises in core but kind of all of these ideas were very much in flux in 2013, 2014, when ideas like the mean stack came out. So right now we're kind of at this stage where we just need to integrate all of these new concepts into a, into a well-established paradigm. And that's why you have this graph. <laughs> uh, everybody has JavaScript fatigue, and now there's JavaScript fatigue, fatigue, and now I'm fatigued about people talking about JavaScript fatigue, fatigue. So yeah, so what this talk is about is kind of coming up with several, with a handful of core principles to kind of integrate all of these things that we're seeing in the JavaScript community. I'm talking about observables, promises, all of these different libraries like Redux and MobX. In my mind, they kind of all fit together in a nice, neat way based on a few core principles. And you can kind of use them together by, uh, by just kind of applying these particular principles. And these principles are kind of like what guides the ideas of these particular, or what guides kind of the uh, implementation details of using these particular libraries. So in my mind, these three core principles, the things that like really come into uh, the three core principles that really make these libraries work and really kind of bind them all together is first, Data is always represented as a, uh, as a serializable object. So things like private properties, not really a concern. Uh, things like helper functions, object-oriented programming, that's what it's not. What it is is just something that you can send over the wire in JSON. Somebody else gets it, takes it out. Here you have your, uh, you have your state again. Um, the other idea is sort of the notion of actions. Um, if you've used Redux before, I presume everybody here has used some Redux. Um, if you use MobX, same thing, actions, NGRX in Angular 2 land, also action-based. And the fundamental idea of how, I of how I think about actions is that actions are basically uh, function calls as objects. So an object representation of calling a function. Because, well, Redux actions, yeah, they, you call, you dispatch an action, but it's really the same thing as calling a function with parameters. There is, uh, it's, the difference is basically just like syntactic sugar. And 
Finally, the next principle is sort of streams of actions and being able to tie in, see all of the actions, change actions in flight, log all actions, uh, process errors in actions. So, if with, so with MobX and NGRX, you get observables. With Redux, middleware reducers are all pretty much an instance of tying into a stream of actions and doing things as a result of actions. And kind of all of these libraries do a similar thing. And how promises tie into that is promises are basically an object-oriented wrapper around an actual action or the result of an action that will be that might be asynchronous. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But first, let's talk about the uh, about the reason for serializable objects being uh, being as important as they are. So. One thing I think that JavaScript needs to move away from is, uh, is the whole model view controller paradigm. I take it you all have all used MVC at some point or heard the term. Um, so model view controller is basically a, was kind of an old way of thinking about how you build a UI application or an app with a UI. So you have, uh, you have your state effectively, which is a model, and changes in the model get propagated or the controller modifies the model, the model notifies the controller of changes, and the controller modifies the view layer, which is kind of, if you've ever written anything with jQuery or vanilla JavaScript, you'd kind of see this similar pattern popping up where, okay, you change something in an object, those changes get propagated to other parts of the code, which then modify elements in the DOM directly. But then we have, but then we came up with Angular and React, and all that was not very much a was not very popular anymore. Um, but the fundamental problem with uh, with model view controller, in my mind, is not necessarily even view. It actually comes down to the model and change tracking and notification being difficult. Particular, particular, this arrow is always the hard part because, well, changes to objects in JavaScript is a very loaded and very deep concept. For example, you can probably say, okay, this is a pretty easy change to track. If I set a.b equal to, that's, uh, that's pretty easy. You can object.define property to, uh, to on the property b and watch for changes. You can diff those two pretty easily. That's, uh, that's pretty straightforward. But then things get a little bit more interesting when you have in-place updates. Let's say b is a date and you try to set the month to seven. For example, this is, uh, this is actually a case that Mongoose doesn't handle. It's a, uh, I think it's like number qu question number three on our FAQ of why don't my in-place date updates get persisted to the database? And that is because, well, uh, we can't really do that for every single type of object out there. We can't really just say, okay, you know, we're gonna uh, go deep into the date internals. If we have a moment object, we can't really go into the moment object because, well, what if moment changes their API? gets very confusing. Another interesting case is, uh, is setting an array index. Um, if the array index already exists, pretty easy, but again, I can always, in JavaScript, I can set whichever array index I want at any time. It doesn't have to exist. You can have an array that was of length one and set index element 12. So tracking that change is kind of cumbersome. And then things get really, really hairy when you start throwing in things like object.define property, like what happens if I decide that, an ob that a property should no longer be immutable? How do I track that change that's, uh, or should no longer be enumerable? There we go. That's, um, that's kind of a change that's virtually impossible to track. And what if I start changing the prototype too? Oh boy. Things get, uh, things go, get really hairy really quick. And actually, like object.define property won't help you catch this change, where if you change the prototype, a.b will, if you, uh, what do you call it? Uh, if you have a defined property on a and you're trying to track changes to the prototype, a.b will still show up as two if you set the prototype, but, uh, but you won't get that change or you won't be able to track that change. So diffing serializable objects is a lot nicer because you don't have to worry about things like this. Because again, uh, enumerable versus non-enumerable is not something that you can serialize in JSON, nor is, uh, nor is really the prototype changes. So change detection, again, very difficult. But this is why, uh, this is why things like immutable JS are so popular, because they prevent you from doing things like mutating dates in place and all those things that make, uh, that make change detection very hard. Serializable objects with object.assign, 
basically means that you can diff two objects just by doing a double or by doing triple equals. So like if I have A and I have A copy and now I assign something to A, I can diff A and A copy by recursively using triple equals. Because if two objects are different, then they're not triple equals each other and otherwise they are. That's kind of the, uh, the long and short of how immutable JS works and how React's diffing works. But where, uh, but where things get very bad with diffing is that you don't get notified of changes as they happen. You can only see changes after the fact, which is what made Angular 1 so bad because you had to go and uh, you would go in and have to diff this entire huge object. So diffing means no change notifications, and that's why you need a new abstraction, which is what actions are all about. And sort of being able to tie, and the idea of being able to tie into an action stream becomes very powerful when you realize that without object.observe, you need some other way to see what's happening in your system and get sort of changes out. So promises, again, uh, presume all, all of you have used promises before. Yes, no? So a promise is, uh, so a promise represents an async action as an object. It's not serializable, but it represents kind of the result of a potentially complex async action. For example, if, uh, how many of you have started using async await yet? Oh, the rest of you should really check it out. It's so cool. Uh, but async await basically gives you, lets you, uh, lets you write out flat logic using for loops, if statements, try catch blocks, et cetera, et cetera. And, with, uh, and within that logic, you can have async operations that you await on, and the entire thing bundles you a nice little promise and returns it back to you. So in my mind, all these action-based architectures tend to use either observables or promises to represent async actions. Again, an observable can also represent an async action, but I find promises a little easier to work with. And also promises integrate nicely with async await. But yeah, these are all like, all these architectures like Redux, MobX, NGRX, these are all, uh, all action-based in the sense that in order to do anything, if the user, say, clicks on a button, that triggers an action, that action goes on to some sort of stream that you can then pipe into, and those changes kind of reflect to the UI as kind of, I guess you would call it a side effect of the action or as an effect of the action. So about why, uh, why function calls as objects? Why is this, uh, why is this important? First, uh, first, or probably one of the best examples is just logging, debugging, and visibility is being able to see all of the actions going through the system. I think one of the things that like made Redux click for me the first time was just, oh, I wrote an application, all of a sudden, hey, I can print everything that's happening to the system in the console without having to, uh, without having to you know, just put console.logs everywhere. All of that just comes baked in for, uh, for free, basically. And that's something that we actually did a lot in the early days of Booster. We had a, uh, we, our first app was uh, Cordova with React on top of it. And we basically did cool things like, oh, we, uh, whenever there was an error, we would dump the state or the entire state of the app into, uh, into Sentry or whatever. And then we can uh, basically re uh, restore the state and then keep debugging from there, print it to the console, see everything that's happened recently. All of these things are very powerful for just building out a nice, neat front-end application. And another, another use case, separating error handling from logic. Again, where, uh, where things get really hairy if you're trying to, uh, if you're trying to build an app is, well, uh, if an error happens, um, is, putting, uh, is putting all of that error handling bundled with your logic. Whereas if you can separate out error handling, you can then define rules like, say, every time there's an HTTP error, you want to show this particular message. That's a pretty difficult thing to do in kind of, uh, in kind of like the old MVC paradigm because there's no real answer for like how an HTTP call really works. It's just something that was globbed into the controller. Um, you needed a separate abstraction in order to handle the case of pop-up whenever there's an HTTP error. Um, you can also compose function calls, pass function calls to other functions. And if an action is an object, you can pass it to another function to do something with that action. And in general, this, is, this enables you to handle what's known as cross-cutting concerns very well. Where, so general idea of a cross-cutting concern, it's a term from something called aspect-oriented programming, which you should read up on Wikipedia. It's actually kind of a cool idea. 
Um, the general idea is that you have functions that represent business logic. So create a new user, update a user, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have cross-cutting concerns that you want to execute on certain subsets of those actions or of those functions or whatever you want to call them. For now, I'll just call them actions. So if you want to execute, like, if you want to log every time you create a new any object, but not log whenever you, uh, whenever you say update an existing one. That's something, that's kind of an instance of a cross-cutting concern where you just want a subsection of the system to do something and another subsection to not do that something. So yeah, general idea of what an, uh, let's just kind of like step back and define like what an action really is. In uh, kind of the strict definition that I like to work with is like an action is just a serializable plain old JavaScript object that basically defines like what the, uh, what the action is you're calling, what parameters you're passing into it, potentially the result and some other properties, and then a promise or an observable that kind of represents the result of the action that will you know, either error or, uh, or, resolve to a, uh, or resolve to a value. But the neat thing, uh, well, going back, uh, observables are nice for a lot of things, but I don't really, but I prefer using promises right now just because async await is so nice. It's a wonderful tool for just building up your business logic in a way that really makes sense. Whereas trying to wrap my head around CycleJS has proven to be a fruitless task for quite a while. So, and the number three principle is on top of these actions, you have a stream of actions or some way of piping into all the actions that are going through the system to log them, to change them in whatever way you see fit, et cetera, et cetera. So, Redux middleware is kind of an instance of an action stream. It's not an observable. It's not like, uh, it doesn't quite match the exact same syntax, but the general idea is the same. You have a stream of actions going through. You want to log them. You want to say, okay, if the payload is a promise, I want to, uh, I want to dot then on the promise and then attach the result to the payload. Little tricks like that. NGRX and, uh, and MobX also have observables for that exact same reason. So instead of, um, so instead of attaching middleware, you instead do a dot map on an observable pipe through and take a look at each action and transform it and modify the original stream. And this is the sort of decoupling that's great for, uh, for preventing, uh, preventing what's called the God function anti-pattern, which is if you, uh, if you have a stream that you can map and mutate and do whatever you want, this kind of decouples the logic so you could have like individual, act, you could have distinct action handlers as opposed to one common handle action function that everything has to go through, which is potentially dangerous. So again, action streams let you do a lot of cool things with logging, error handling, as well as letting you kind of throw errors if somebody, if uh, another developer is doing something that you don't expect. I'll have a little example of that in a little bit. Another, uh, another neat property is again, mirroring changes or having side effects. Like if your data changes, you probably want to persist that data to say Firebase or Parsley if you're using, or Parse rather, if you're using Parse. Um, HTTP requests using, uh, for example, NGRX has a notion of effects, which basically is an action goes through and now you have a side effect that triggers an HTTP request, which then triggers more actions. So just general cross-cutting concerns. And I find, in my mind, kind of all these fit together into something that I've called the Tau architecture for the last like year or so. Um, just kind of this particular little stack that replaces MVC in my mind. So type, serializable object representing raw data. Action, Java serializable object plus, uh, plus promise or observable or some other representation of an async operation, like say a future or something, that mutates the raw data. And then you have an action stream that you can, or observable, that you can use to see all of the actions flowing through the system and change them. Now, uh, I find this architecture is, this architecture pattern is pretty common on the front end, but it's not common on the back end yet. But on the other hand, things like Falcor pretty much do this on the back end. And Booster's backend for the better part of the last year has actually been powered by this as well. And we've sort of started open sourcing kind of the core libraries that we use to, uh, to make this all happen. Um, so for types, we have our own type library called Archetype. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it later. 
for actions on top of our MongoDB database. We, uh, we use a library called Monogram, which I'll also show you, and our observables are just Rx. So what Archetype is all about is basically composing types and adding in custom types. Now, I, I like JSON schema, I like Joy. I, work, I might have heard a thing or two about Mongoose, but, uh, but these are all kind of limited by, uh, by their clunky custom type APIs. Things that really kind of bug me is like a JSON schema cannot be a property value for another JSON schema, which is one thing that I wanted to get out of Archetype. So an Archetype property can be a moment.js object, a MongoDB object ID, can even be another Archetype. So here's a little example. So I have a person whose name is a string. They have a band ID, which is a custom type that is just plain old MongoDB object ID. They have a created at, which is a, actually a moment object. Uh, moment is a popular date library for JavaScript. And now I can go in and create a new person, and they will have a, uh, they will have a created at that's a moment. It'll, parse the, it'll convert this string into an object ID. It will kind of destructure it into the, uh, into the format that you define. And where things get really fun is, uh, is actually you can compose a, an archetype as a perfectly valid type for another archetype. So now you can have a band that contains a list of people, and each, uh, each person get, ties back to this. So now I can create a uh, band with a guy by the name of Axel Rose. Awesome, right? Uh, but things get, but I think the thing that I really want to talk about is, uh, is Monogram, which is the thing that we just OD, uh, open sourced about a, probably like a week or two ago. Um, this is kind of like our action layer on top of the MongoDB driver. Um, it provides both, uh, both uh, action and action streams for, uh, for MongoDB or on top of the MongoDB driver. So it's not an ODM by any stretch of the imagination, but it can do a lot of ODM-like things and solve similar tasks. So, where, uh, so how, we, uh, how you think about Monogram is there are, two, uh, there are kind of two places that you think about. There's, uh, there's the business logic space and then there's the action space. So in business logic, you have a collection and you insert a new document with key hello uh, property world. And in action space, you have, uh, you can have this particular, you define this function or this, uh, this handler for basically that happens before any action executes. And you take, can take the action and the action looks like this basically. An action has an underscore ID, which is a unique identifier for the action. It has the collection name, uh, the actual, the actual function name, the parameters passed in, and any function calls that were chained onto the, uh, the original function call. So now you have, uh, you have your business logic, which just does whatever it normally does, creates, inserts documents, does whatever, and you can have completely isolated logic that sees all actions going through it and can sort of tie into that stream, can throw errors, change parameters, do all of, uh, do all of this kind of, uh, all of these cross-cutting concerns and ancillary logic that you don't want to put in your business logic. Error handling, logging, um, general rules for what you can and cannot do. Show you a few examples. So this is, uh, so this is our, like, just copy and paste it from our logging. Um, basically, before every action, we go in and print out the, um, or use the debug module to print out the function, or the collection name, the function, and the parameters passed in. And here's, like, a sample output. We, uh, we're inserting a new promotion with some code definitions and various other properties. Another th example we use it for is, uh, is preventing shooting yourself on the foot. So uh, how many of you have uh, accidentally overwritten a MongoDB object by, by not using dollar set? Uh, anybody? Oh, okay, one person, alas. I guess, uh, I guess full stack doesn't use MongoDB anymore, right? Oh man! Oh, it's okay. We're not all perfect, huh? Uh, well, the the kind of the problem there is that so in MongoDB, if you do a update operation, you need to specify a dollar set. Otherwise, you'll overwrite the document. So even if you want to mutate one property, you'll overwrite the entire document with that one property unless you unless you dollar set. So this is something that uh, that kind of ends up has ended up shooting us in the foot a couple of times. Thank goodness for backups. Always back up your database. Pro tip. <laughs> pay, uh, pay good money to back up your database. It will, it will, it's worth it. <laughs> and um, so this is a function that basically goes in and disallows any, uh, implicit, uh, any implicit replace operations. So 
basically before any operation where the name includes update, we're going to go in and double check that, uh, that the first key starts with dollar because otherwise, uh, otherwise we'll implicitly overwrite the document. And there's a, uh, there's a replace one function if you want to explicitly overwrite. And this is kind of what the output looks like. You'll get an assertion error with an overwriting document with updates not allowed. And keep in mind, this, uh, the business logic doesn't see any of this. So the actual code that's going in and says, OK, you know, whenever, uh, whenever a user does this, I need to go in and update their vehicle or something like that, that doesn't actually see any of this particular logic. That's all kind of baked into here. And, that, uh, and again, this is kind of us tying into the, ac into the action stream and looking at action space as opposed to business logic space. And here's another fun, uh, another fun example is setting timestamps on every document. So every time you update a document, you want to set updated at. Every time you create a new document, you want to create uh, set its created at and its updated at. So before, so the only two ways to create a document: insert and insert, or insert one, insert many. Create a new, uh, create a new document and attach or attach updated at and created at. And if there is a, uh, there's. What do you call it? If you get an update one, update many, or find one and update, you go in and you set uh, the dollar set dot updated that. Ha! Make and make sure you don't trigger the uh, the first error. So kind of uh, future work that uh, we're going to be doing with this, we're going to uh, well cleaner MongoDB errors. E1100 is a classic case of um, violating a unique constraint. It's a very ugly looking error, but one that people run into a lot because well. If you set a unique index and then you break and then you try to insert a document with a duplicate key, you'll start getting all these ugly errors that aren't very user friendly. Another neat thing, profiling all queries and cool logging that can display in flight notifications. And these are all kind of five line tasks that look an awful lot like this. And one of the other, that's kind of what makes this so neat is a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of like the good solid dev, dev practice rules that you want to do like logging to the console in dev mode and profiling your queries in production things like that those all become kind of like five line tasks as opposed to um, as opposed to really cumbersome refactors and kind of the bigger task I think is like kind of an ODM like layer using archetype that does uh, that does kind of the validation logic and minimal change tracking and diffing that mongoose can do for you but kind of, but do it in a way that uh, that uh, that well, that jives with the way that Monogram does things. Because again, one thing that Monogram does absolutely does not do is there's no uh, there's no like how in an ORM you say uh, you're creating a new object. You never do that. You're simply triggering actions on the database as opposed to creating a new instance of test as you might do in like Mongoose or SQLize here. Instead of doing that, you're just doing individual actions. So yeah, uh, thank you guys. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Booster just raised a B round and we're hiring. So if you're interested in uh, in hearing more or seeing if you want to work with us, uh, email me valboosterfuels.com. Uh, we're based out of the San Francisco Bay Area right now. So thank you, uh, thank you guys for listening. Hope you got something out of it. And time for questions. And feel free to clap if you want. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. So here, here's where uh, here's where things get hairy with hooks. Is uh, there's actually three distinct types of hooks in Mongoose. There are middleware. There's uh, document middleware, query middleware, and model middleware. So uh, so document middleware is like if I dot save on a document. Um, if you uh, if you do like um, if you do model dot insert many, that's the model middleware. And then if you do like uh, model.find.count.exec, that's actually query middleware. And all of those come with their own kind of interesting caveats. They all have different values of this, which is how you kind of get state from the, in those hooks. And I don't think the thing with Mongoose middleware is like you, it does a good job of catching, um, of letting you instrument the individual functions like save 
it doesn't really let you do a very good job of instrumenting a broad class of functions like, say, logging everything to the console. That's not something that Mongoose supports very well. Profile all database operations. Again, another thing that Mongoose wouldn't do too well. So it's more of like an action is kind of like a stronger abstraction than, uh, than Mongoose middleware. Also because, uh, well, one of the things with, uh, with Mongoose is like, because, uh, because the, um, let's see here. Uh, because the because where you get all of the uh, all of the data or all of the state from is from the this function. One, you can't use arrow functions, and two, you're just tied to this uh, kind of very big, heavy, potentially heavy object that is kind of internal to Mongoose. Has a lot of internal state. Has uh, if you let's say you accidentally mutate the model in a pre-insert many hook. You can basically break your database connection. There's a lot of stuff in that in that uh, in that object that is just not relevant for hooks, and the stuff that is relevant is kind of obfuscated by the uh, by the stuff that isn't. Cool. Any uh, any other questions? Anybody have anything they want to hear about? Also happy to talk about just you know JavaScript programming in general. Uh, okay, good job living in the Bay Area. Uh, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> cool. Five seconds or forever hold your peace. Cool. Um, can you oh. talk, I guess, about the, uh, what was life like before Mongoose and why, you know, obviously, uh, there, 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 there used to be a paradigm where people would just interact with Mongoose and be directed. Um, so maybe just the, 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 the founding, founding story, I guess. Uh, actually, uh, David was not quite right. I didn't found Mongoose, but I took it over when it was a much smaller NPM module than it than it is now. Like when I took it over, it had about like 20,000 monthly downloads back in uh, back in 2014. Now it's up to like 1.2 million and like 12,000 GitHub stars and all the good stuff. Um, but why uh, I think like kind of why we got into Mongoose in the first place was just. Uh, the MongoDB driver used to have uh, used to have like a lot of uh, a lot of cruft and a lot of uh, and and uh, awful lot of callbacks and that kind of made things very painful. Whereas Mon uh, it used to be that in order to say, let me get an example. In order to say do like db dot collection of test, uh, you actually needed to pass a callback to the collection function. So you needed like two or three layers of callbacks to actually do anything useful, which was very uh, which was very disappointing. And so we decided, and so then we started using Mongoose, so and that let us trip uh, cut out a few layers of callbacks, um, and also take care of uh, and also take care of like you know validation casting all that stuff, which saved us an awful lot of time. But things like uh, connection buffering was another big thing that we really liked, which is um, basically you can you can connect to Mongoose and then start doing operations immediately, without waiting for it to formally connect to the database. And then you can just kind of have like uh, event handler or like on connected and on disconnected to check to you know debug in case you failed to connect to the database or you lost the connection after initially connecting. So that made uh, that's kind of what made Mongoose a lot neater for us in the first place, but that was like back in 2012. So things have kind of gotten a little bit more sophisticated since then, and um, and then you know started using middleware and plugins more, and that all of a sudden made it a much more powerful tool for us. Um, this was actually for a uh, for a fashion tech startup that we were working on in like 2012, 2013. Um, Maybe, well, if you want to hear more about that, I can talk about it. But, well, the general idea was that, um, was that yeah, Mongoose let us, uh, miss, uh, let us miss out on extra callbacks. And that was back before co-yield or async await were really prevalent. Um, I think we started on, like, node 0 0.8, so generators were not really part of the language yet. So at that point, you were stuck using callbacks. There was really not much else you could do. Uh, promises didn't really exist in their current state in any library that I know of until like 2012, 2013. So yeah. Cool. Yes? I, I know you mentioned that your company was starting to like open source and tools like architects. Yeah. 
figure it's something that we can uh, that we can it's something that we can open source because it's not really necessarily part of our core business logic or anything that like is really sensitive to the company and easy well, COVID separation makes it easier for us to um, makes it easier for us to just you know develop different code bases in parallel um, also helps with building documentation because it's very easy to uh, it's very easy to say okay you know our well, like, it's an internal tool. We don't document it at all. Whereas making something open source, you start thinking like, okay, now like people are actually looking at this. Maybe I should like write some docs or put some comments in there or something <laughs> at least. Goodness gracious! So yeah, the kind of like dark aspects of code that, uh, or the dark aspects of the code that don't have any documentation or comments often end up being the worst. Especially since like uh, you'd be surprised. Like archetype is a very very sophisticated like tricky to implement library just because like there is so much recursion in there it sometimes warps my mind I had to uh, <laughs> it's pretty fun actually I wrote a large I think I completely rewrote how it handled defaults while I was in a fishing lodge in Yakutat Alaska it was pretty fun but I just kind of spent like hours of this just random fishing lodge after a day of gutting salmon just like oh man I how am I doing this I don't know but well it, it actually works so now uh, and I've got tests to prove it and so that but now I go back and look at it and I'm like how did I write that I don't even know but somehow it works so yeah and that's when uh, and that's another good reason to kind of put it in open source world is so like be surprised like what people can come up with when they actually like look at your code and they start and they start being like oh hey this is really interesting I want to help work on this I want to work with this company or they start thinking like oh hey this particular place where you wrote code is absolutely terrible how about you uh, how about you improve that so it kind of makes all of your uh, all of your good and bad decisions public and helps you uh, and helps you work around the bad decisions and hopefully improve them yes, yeah my code isn't perfect I well Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't figured that out yet, but. <laughs> yes? Just talking about the mean stack, um, which, you know, I think went back two years ago. Uh, 2013. It's been probably four years and change. And obviously, you know, things have moved a lot since then. Yeah. Um, like, I think uh, for us, I was just thinking about like, what our stack would be. It's kind of CERN, um, <laughs> which is like SQL and, and React. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Never really thought too much about how I adopt new technologies because they're usually uh, usually just ends up being like this. Uh, I don't know, like this. It just ends up being like this library just solves like such a uh, problem that's just so obvious uh, to me that like I uh, that, like it's a problem that I didn't even realize I had. But now that I can, now that I see it, like I can't unsee it. I see that I have this problem. I need something to uh, I need something to fix it. That's kind of like how I got into RxJS in the first place. Was um, was like I had heard about Bacon JS stuff like that, similar libraries to uh, similar library stars. Uh, Bacon JS was kind of like an RxJS predecessor, sort of like filterable, mappable streams type thing. Um, and uh, and also there was like you know the Node Streams API, which was always a little clunky, but did something similar to RxJS. But then I went to uh, what's a JSConf Uruguay in, uh, in I think it was 2015, and I uh, got to meet uh, Matt Podwisaki, the uh, he's the dude on Twitter with the uh, with the wizard hat. <laughs> he's one of the guys that uh, that works on RxJS right now. And uh, over uh, over a bottle of wine at some CD bar in Montevideo, he uh, he just kind of explained to me like, yeah, like you have the you have these streams, right? But like you can filter them, and you can map them, and you can merge them together, and you can do like really cool stuff where you just take like this stream and that stream and that stream and combine them all together, and then just kind of transform that stream in a common way. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can't unsee this now. This is uh, this is really crazy. So then I started using RX, and uh, well. I've had uh, have had some ups and downs with RxJS and some disagreements, but still uh, still using it. Um, have considered switching over to Xtreme, but, uh, which is the guy who wrote Rx, Andre Stalls, his um, um, his kind of like alternative library. Um, but haven't really seen enough of a need to switch off. It's just um, 
sometimes you know you just see uh, you just see a library that like really does something that you didn't really know or that solves a problem that you didn't really know existed before and just kind of like changes the way you think about things and then uh, and then that's something that you can like really adopt but you know incremental change is I guess it's kind of like the difference between like really slow incremental improvements versus uh, versus like you know complete paradigm shift whereas for uh, if you're doing like choosing between like Bluebird versus RSVP versus WinJS or all these other things, it's like it's kind of a waste because they're all pretty much promised libraries. They all give you kind of the same thing. One might have like slightly faster dot finally, but at which but at that point, you know, it doesn't really matter too much. Whereas something like promises in general that kind of comes in and says, oh well, you can actually like chain things and uh, instead of having callbacks, you kind of have like a flat structure based on dot then. And oh by the way, we're going to throw async await on top of that. Then things start getting really interesting. And if it's something that like really kind of changes the way you think about stuff um, in a way that really kind of resonates with you, I think that that's kind of how I go for adopting new libraries. Hmm. Yeah, uh, another another thought related to that. Like I've uh, tried a few times to actually write an alternative ODM. As a matter of fact, the uh, the first monogram came out and like was kind of something that I didn't really finish to the stage where I wanted to publicize it back in 2015, and it was based on object.observe. But one of the reasons why I never really like wanted to kind of publicize it was it wasn't really that much better than Mongoose. It was maybe like a small incremental improvement. Um, whereas monogram is something completely different. So that's kind of why I'm l going to, why I'm kind of talking about it now is like it's something that really just turns the idea of an ODM or RM kind of on its head. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Sold. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. It was great to be here. And